I'm Anne Marie Lipinski. I'm the curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism here at Harvard, and it is um, such a pleasure to welcome you all to Harvard and to uh, Lippmann House uh, for tonight's presentation of the J. Anthony Lucas Prize Project Awards, which honor the best in nonfiction uh, American book writing. The winner's work exemplifies the literary grace and commitment to serious research and social concern that carried, um, that characterized the award's namesake. In celebrating tonight's gifted winners, we remember Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist J. Anthony Lucas, a 1969 Neiman Fellow who I first um, met here some years later when I was uh, a Neiman Fellow, uh, and the late Mark Linton, a history enthusiast and senior executive at the firm Hunter Douglas in the Netherlands. Linton's wife, Marion, and children Lily and Michael established the Mark Linton History Prize and have generously sponsored the Lucas Prize project since its creation. We are honored to have with us Mark Linton's uh, daughter Lily. Welcome Lily, welcome back. Other board members here are Chairman Jonathan Alter, who you'll hear uh, more from later tonight, Danielle Allen, Shay Earhart, Phyllis Bran, uh, Tony Lucas's wife, uh, Linda Healy, uh, Pamela Paul, and Abby Wright. It's so good to see you all here again. As many of you would know, judging book prizes is uh, challenging and time consuming, guaranteed to secure you the approval of a few. Uh, who win and nothing from those who don't. Um, we had a record number of entries this year and on behalf of the prize board, I want to acknowledge um, special gratitude to all of our jurors, including those with us tonight, Mark Kurlansky and William Schinker. Thank you so much. And thank you also to Neiman's uh, Samantha Henry, Christine Kay, and Carrie Cashmore, as well as Columbia's Caroline Martinet for smoothly engineering the entire um, evening. Um, when author and journalist Tony Lucas started a writing career that would distinguish him as one of the country's master storytellers, it was here at Harvard, while still an undergraduate reporter at the Harvard Crimson. He returned to campus as a Neiman Fellow in the class of 1969. During his remarkable career, he won two Pulitzer Prizes, the first in 1968 for a New York Times story headlined The Two Worlds of Linda Fitzpatrick, uh, which was an investigative piece about a Connecticut teenager whose wealthy family had no knowledge of her drug-ridden life in the East Village until she and her boyfriend were found beaten to death. His second Pulitzer came 18 years later for Common Ground, a turbulent decade in the lives of three American families. Uh, his landmark work about school desegregation and busing in Boston. It is hard to overstate the power of that book, which holds a place of distinction in our library here of Neiman Fellows works. For many journalists I know, Common Ground has long served as a standard bearer for deeply reported long form narrative. And it is a rare year that I do not hear a fellow name it as one of the books that had the most profound impact on them and their development as a writer. One of Lucas's great gifts, I think, was his ability to pair the common with the combustible. There is always a fine tension running beneath the most mundane moments. And I think that writing must well um, characterize what it would have been like to be in Boston during that period. And if you'll indulge me, um, I just wanted to read something that I think exemplifies that. In the book, it's, um, chapter it's the beginning of chapter 24 um, called The Editor. The lobster shift was a lonely one for the guard manning the marble lobby of the Boston Globe. In the dismal hours between midnight and dawn, few employees came in or out. The phone on the reception desk stopped ringing. The only sound was the thump and swish of the giant presses. John McAuliffe would fortify himself with styrofoam cups of muddy coffee while he waited for the freshly printed paper to come up from the loading dock. When the first edition arrived on the morning of October 7th, 1974, he turned to the sports section, 
pleased to see that the Patriots had butchered the Baltimore Colts, 42 to three. But the ink on the page was still wet and a black smudge came off on his fingers. He was reaching for a towel when he heard the first shot. Dropping to his knees behind the desk, he could see the bullet hole, round and dark as a copper penny, drilled through the plate glass windows. Then he heard another volley crash into the press room. At the newspaper's north entrance, guard Richard Cushing watched a beige sedan parked by the median strip of Morrissey Boulevard. A man clambered out, rested a rifle on the hood, and pumped several more shots into the building. Then the door slammed and the car fishtailed up the boulevard. When the police arrived at 12.47 a.m., they found three holes in the press room window and a fourth slug lodged in the lobby, a few inches away from where John McAuliffe had been reading his newspaper. Yeah. Tony published five important books, each an examination of a critical rift in America's social uh, and political landscape, each seen through the lens of individuals caught up in the tides of change. He was a journalist of extraordinary depth and intensity with an almost preternatural focus on methodology. During the reporting for Common Ground, he abandoned one family midway through his seven-year project because his first choice, he determined, was not working dramatically. He was absolutely brilliant, author David Halberstam once said. He took journalism to a high intellectual level, yet he also had the doggedness of an old-fashioned police reporter. The year following his death, his widow, Linda Healy, joined with friends and colleagues to honor his memory by creating the Lucas Prize Project. We thank Linda, the Linton family, and our partners at the Columbia Journalism School for these awards, which we embrace as a way to showcase exceptional narrative work in book form and remember an esteemed Neiman Fellow. <laughs>